I have chosen here to, to talk about lesser known protein protein interactions. And this is, of course, a little bit where you're coming from, um, what is lesser known. Uh, but I think that what I have picked is really lesser known. But, but let's see. Uh, so the first slide here is uh, also the motivational slide. Um, I think that many of you who are here today have an, already have an interest in protein interactions. And um, so if we look first here in, in a living cell, we have actually a lot of proteins and it's a very dense environment. We have up to 40% of the volume is occupied by things other than water. So there, there will be a lot of interactions between proteins and of course also other matter. And this is important in this setting also when we are talking about antibodies in solution, uh, for example, formulation of vaccines, you want to have a high dose of antibodies and there will be strong protein-protein interactions. Um, and how to describe them, how to control them uh, is very important for, for example, the stability, the viscosity of the samples and so on. Um, but it's also important in, for example, food formulation where you can use proteins to control uh, taste, texture and mouthfeel and so on. And lastly, I'd like to, to mention that as a background, we have actually a very complicated uh, matrix of ions. So we have water and electrolytes and that also plays a very important role on the protein-protein interactions. Um, I think a very good example is the pH that we often use as a handle to control uh, protein interactions. And it's part of this background, but we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that today. So let's think about when we say protein-protein interactions, what do we actually mean? Um, so here I have two proteins and we are obviously interested in how they interact with each other. And um, here we have to remember that it's not just proteins that we have to talk about because around the protein, we actually have water. So we also need to consider the protein water interaction. And because there are now waters, so we also need to consider how waters interact with each other. This is a very important feature of any aqueous solution. The water-water the, the interaction is very dominant on how the, the solutes they behave. We could even start to add co-solutes, so this could be small molecules or salt, and they will of course also interact with the protein with themselves and with the water. And in order to describe the, 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 the solution, we need to take into account all of these interactions. We cannot skip any of them. Um, so, so it's really an effect of all of them. At the same time, we have to remember that Often the systems we are interested in, we have a temperature in the system. So um, the particles are not static. They move around, they rotate, they diffuse and so on. And we need to capture that as well. We need to be able to describe all of that uh, simultaneously. So if we consider non-covalent interatomic interactions, if we really go back to basics and think about how can two atoms interact with each other, and it turns out that there are not so many ways we can think about. Uh, and basically, I would say an important part here is that, that all atoms, they have an excluded volume and there can be some electric interactions on top of that. And by electric interactions, I mean two things. Uh, I mean that there can be dispersion interactions and there can be Coulombic interactions, for example, if we have an ion. Um, and that's, that's about it. Um, so we have very few interactions to, to actually take into account. And all of this then uh, builds up a lot of more intricate interactions, we could say. So now we have our two proteins over here and we consider the interaction between two proteins, two, two atoms. And we have to remember that we embed this into some background here of and typically an aqueous solution. So let's see what happens now. So from these fairly uh, basic interactions over here, we can now describe and talk about a lot of more complicated interactions that I'm sure that many of you will have heard of before. We can have hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions. And that's very much related to, for example, what I mentioned earlier, the water-water interaction. 
we can have crowding, which is an entropic effect. We can have screening due to ions. And sometimes if we have um, multivalent ions, we can have ion compensation, overcharging, and so on. Uh, and now we come to, to three parts that I've marked in green down here. And that's actually the ones that I, I want to talk about today. Uh, so I would like to talk about charge regulation, uh, Hofmeister effects, and Van der Waals interactions. I think that the, the last one, Van der Waals interactions, I, I don't think this is really belongs to lesser known protein-protein interactions because it's something you will find in any uh, biophysical textbook. But I'd like to just highlight a few things that I think uh, could be lesser known, but uh, we'll get back to, to that in the, in the end of the, the talk. Um, so that's, that's the outline. I cannot really talk about all of this because it would be a very, very long uh, lecture then. Um, the idea is that these three parts, they are fairly separate. So I'll just try to explain what, what these uh, different effects, what they are and how we can describe them. And um, I've tried to do this in an kind of an educational, um, in, a, in an educational way. It's not gonna be much research. It's going to be a little bit about what we've done in the past. And I have a little bit of unpublished results, but most of it is just descriptions about these mechanisms and how they could affect protein-protein interactions in solution. So when we, if we have the possibility to describe all these effects, we can do that with, for example, computer simulations. And this is what I do uh, normally. So that's why I, I'm just highlighting it here. Um, so here we have a box of proteins and by taking into account interactions between individual particles, we can then capture all of these, all of these effects that we have here. Um, and once we describe them in simulation, we can then start to calculate properties. And many of these are properties that you could go out and measure in experimentally. It could be the osmotic pressure, view coefficient, structure factors, and so on. So we can get information from the simulations from a microscopic uh, picture and relate that to the experimental uh, data. But I will try to talk, not to talk too much about simulations today, but mostly about mechanisms. So with that short introduction, I think we can get started with the first topic and that's gonna be charge regulation. And um, I, I start off a little bit morbid here because uh, these are the, here you see two really very highly influential um, physical chemists, John Gamble Kirkwood and Lars Ansager here buried next to each other. And um, you, you can see here that Kirkwood was a very, uh, he, he made a lot of contributions, including charge regulation. That's why I mentioned mention him here. And of course, Lars Ansager, a bit, little bit more modest, it's just Nobel laureate and then asterisk, etc. cetera here. Um, and they were contemporary, these two. Um, Kirkwood never got the Nobel prize, but he, I think it could be because he, he passed away very relatively young, I would say. And he was, the, he was one of the first to describe the charge regulation mechanism. And let's just try and go, go through what, what that means. So this is an effect that arises due to protein fluctuations. And what we have here is a, is a molecule and it can, with, with some titratable sites, and we have, for example, carboxylic acid and an amine. And what they will do, that they will be in equilibrium now with the protons in the solution so that there will be a fluctuation of their charge state. So at any given time, we can come and have a, observe the site and we will either find a proton or it will be free. So this means that, for example, up here, the, this site will, will alternate between being, in a, being an anion or being neutral. This one from neutral and being a cation. So the charge distribution is not static, but it's fluctuating. And that's the origin of the charge regulation mechanism. And to see this, we can see what happens when we take two particles, two molecules, and put them next to each other. Uh, and this means that when we do that, the charge distributions, they can now become correlated 
And that means that the, we will have a lowering of the free energy. For example, let's say that this side down here could be a carboxylic acid, and this one up here could be an amine. So this one can alternate between zero and plus one, and this one zero and minus one. And there will be a, a correlation between these. So more frequently, you would find that there would be a minus uh, and plus combination because that would lower the electrostatic uh, energy. So all of this in total lowers the free energy. And this means that a new intermolecular interaction arises due to that. So this was discovered a long time ago uh, by Kirkwood and Schumacher, this paper uh, from the early 50s. But it actually turns out that the charge regulation mechanism was discovered actually a lot earlier, 30 years earlier at, by Kai Linnerstone Lang. And the interesting thing about this is that he comes from the Carlsberg Laboratories. And at that time, they were very interested in describing proteins and the physical chemistry of proteins. Uh, Kyle Lindstrom's boss, uh, he was, it was Sørensen, so he was the one that determined or, or established the pH concept. So all of this in sort of an, in trying to understand enzymes and proteins uh, for beer production. So if we continue a little bit, I'll try and, and keep the, the equations a little bit down in this presentation. So what I have a little bit here, and I think it's important to understand the charge regulation mechanism. And um, here we have a multiple expansion. So here we have to imagine that this is one charge distribution. This could be a protein and we have another protein or macromolecule over here. And we can now express the electrostatic energy between these as a function of the mass sensor separation here. And this, this, this is a, a fairly easy to do. And uh, if you do that, you get something that looks like this, a multiple expansion where we can express here the free energy of interaction as a, a series of terms. And the first term is something that I think we all know quite well. And that is the iron-iron or monopole-monopole interaction. So what we have here is just the net charge of one of the distributions times the net charge of the other one divided by the distance. So that's like a Coulomb interaction, but from macroscopic bodies. And this is the reason why we say that if we have two like charged proteins, they will probably repel. And you could predict that using a multiple expansion like this. But there will be higher order terms and they are coming up down here. So for example, if the charge distribution is uneven, there will be a contribution from the iron and with a dipole, with a dipole and dipole and iron quadrupole and so on. We can continue this expansion all, all out here. And we can see for the iron dipole, it decays as one over R4. I should mention that the results here, they are they're actually angularly or average. So we have allowed the charge distributions to rotate as well. And you can see that it decays as one over R4, this one as one over R6 and so on. Um, normally when we do these multiple expansions, we keep the charge distribution fixed. We assume that there are no fluctuations, but we've just argued that there are fluctuations if you have titratable groups like carboxyl acid, acid and uh, amines and so on. So performing this multiple expansion and not Normally, if the charge distribution is constant, these terms, they cancel out. But if not, then we actually get extra contributions. And you see that they come in here right after the iron-iron terms. So we have an iron-induced iron, induced iron, induced iron. And we see here that they decay as one over R squared. So they are relatively long ranged. And we can see that they depend here on the charge and run one side times what we call the capacitance C on the other proteins and so on. So even in the case when the proteins are completely neutral, we can still have an electrostatic attraction between them as we see here. So if this term, the net charge is neutral, we can still have this term coming up here. And that's simply just due to the fluctuations of the, of the protonation states. So 
To, to use this, I think it's important that we try to describe what the capacitance is, the C, and um, this I'll do in the next slide here. So here we have the ion induced uh, terms in the multiple expansion and they contribute to the protein-protein interaction. And you also see that it's always a negative contribution. So this means it's always attractive. The capacitance here, you can see that this measures the fluctuation in the net charge, and that's always going to be a positive number. So the contribution to the protein-protein interaction is always um, attractive. And it turns out that the fluctuation in the net charge here, it's actually very easy to obtain experimentally because it corresponds to the derivative of the pH titration curve. So if you have measured the protein charge as a function of pH, we can take the derivative of that function and we get the capacitance. So with this, we can obtain from both experiment, but also from, from theories and simulations. It's quite easy to obtain this uh, property. And if we do that, sorry for the very monochrome uh, image here, I hope we can, we can read it. So we have here, we start with the pH titration curve. So charge versus pH, we take the derivative and then we end up with curves that look like this. So here we have it for NMR, that's the circles. And then we have a null model, an ideal model where we just consider the sequence of the protein. So we can predict, okay, we have, an, we have a lysine here and we, as we, we have a PK value and we can then take the derivative of that. Uh, and getting the capacitance like this. And thirdly, the fully drawn lines are from our Monte Carlo simulation. And we don't need to go into too much details about this other than note that we have here at low pH and at high pH, we have peaks. And this corresponds to that we have a lot of uh, titratable sites, which are in their pH is close to their pK value. And this means that they can fluctuate a lot. Um, so this is very typical for most proteins. They will have peaks here around pH 4, corresponding to aspartates and glutamates. And then up here in the high region, we have lysines, arginines, and so on. Here in the middle, <clears throat> we typically have lower um, capacitance, except if you have a lot of histidines, um, then we can have higher capacitance up here. So we see also that we can use this kind of information to judge whether the charge fluctuation attraction is at play or not. Because if we have a very low capacitance, this means that these prefactors here, are the, they're, they're, if they're small, then this is going to be a small contribution. So we can use the concept here to determine uh, if this is important or not. So here I'd like to show how, how the fluctuation force can influence the interaction between two proteins. So here we have a uh, lysozyme interacting with calbindin. So this is done using computer simulations. And we can do that with, this is the with uh, static charges. So this means that we just assume that we have a, a constant charge distribution, which is, which I would say is, is common to do in the computer simulations. And we can include a fluctuating charge. And this, this we can do in Monte Carlo simulations by simply uh, alternating the charge state. Um, you just have to do it in the, you know, in the right way. So we keep a constant pH. And comparing these two, here we have the, <clears throat> the, the mass center separation. And here we have the angularly averaged interaction free energy, so the potential of mean force. And we can see that we start to, we go from up a purely repulsive system to something where we start to see a attraction. And this is due to the fluctuations of the charge. We can study this a little bit further and have a look at what happens here with the charge of the two proteins. So here again, we have the mass center separation and here we have the charge of lysozyme and the charge of galbindin. We see that lysozyme doesn't change much. Um, and there are two reasons for that. One is that it has a, this, this condition, it has a very low capacitance. And secondly, the charge of calbindin is fairly low, so it doesn't induce as much charge in lysozyme. The other way around though, this has a, lysozyme has a high charge, 
and calbindin has a high capacitance. So here we get a big response in the charge distribution. So we go from 1.5 at, at, at fast separations into actually shifting uh, sign when we are close separations. And that's the, the charge is simply because we can uh, we can release protons as the two proteins they approach each other. And this is not just something that happens between proteins and proteins. It could also be a protein approaching a, a surface, it could be a membrane, it could be it could be DNA or something like that, a mineral surface, and you can have these effects. It could also be a small iron phosphate, for example, could approach protein, and you could imagine that phosphate would also see fluctuations in its charge uh, because it has pK values close to pH 7. So that's, that's uh, the charge regulation mechanism. And just to, to end this section, we can talk about the capacitance. So what that is, and I would say that it's an intrinsic molecular property and it's very similar to how you would talk about the net charge and the dipole moment. It enters the multiple expansion. And it's a property that you could calculate for a single protein and then use that to say something about how, how uh, proteins interact together. Um, it measures the fluctuations in the charge. And this is in a way uh, how easy it is to distort the proton equilibria of the titratical groups. And it's something that's um, since in proteins we have a lot of uh, titratable groups, this is something that uh, can easily occur in proteins. And it's strongly dependent on pH and on the pK values of the titratable groups. At pH 7, we often have only small effects, and that's because we have no groups titrating there except for the histidines. So, so they can be com important contributor, contributors to uh, charge regulation at pH 7. Other than that, we have to go to either more acidic or more al alkaline pH to see the effect. We can obtain it either experimentally or from calculations, just the derivative of the proton titration curve. And we can see that it enters the uh, free energy between macromolecules. So, that's a little bit about the, the charge fluctuation mechanism. And I think this definitely belongs to the lesser known mechanisms. It's uh, you, if, you, if you go back in time, you can see that this has come up sort of with, a, I don't know, maybe a 20 year uh, interval. So sometimes it uh, gets some attention and then it kind of dies out again. So it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, in it, I would say in the obscure end, but I wouldn't say that it's unimportant. Uh, and we can, um, there are now more and more methods in, for example, molecular dynamic simulations methods where you start to include fluctuating charges. And there, I, I suspect that we will start to see these mechanisms again. Right. So let's move on to the part two. And um, this is about iron specific effects and um, also sometimes known as Hofmeister effects. But I would say more generally, it's iron specific effects. The Hofmeister series is a is a it's an early discovery uh, about ions, and it's it's a, it's a limited uh, effect, I would say. And um, the, the 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 very nice picture here is uh, is done by uh, Stefan Hansen, who's a former student, and we are trying to to use this for a journal cover. We don't know if they will accept it yet, but um, what this is about? This is a cup of coffee. And you see here in the foam, that's actually a caffeine molecule that we are investigating. We are investigating how the thermodynamics is affected by these, um, let's call it ionic candy lying around here on the, on the plate. So these are different ions and they will affect the caffeine molecule and the caffeine-caffeine interactions significantly. And we're trying to study that using experiment and computer simulations. Um, so let's try and, and go through the ion specific effects and I'll try to I'll try to outline the sort of the major effects that's behind uh, these observations. And this is something that has been, I would say fairly recently has been uh, unraveled. This has been a puzzle for a very long time. Um, but I think we know now pretty much what's going on, but I'll try and explain it. <clears throat> so the Hofmeister series here, 
uh, was discovered by Franz Hofmeister. And uh, what he did was to take different proteins and look at their solubility as you added different salts. And what he observed was that the, depending on what salt you added, you would have a, uh, different solubilities basically. And um, here we have a list of anions and cations and they are ranked according to how well they, they um, sold in or sold out the proteins. Uh, but it's important to note that when he did these uh, discoveries, it was not at all clear that salts would dissolve into, uh, like dissociate into distinct ions. This was highly controversial at the time. Uh, so this is something, this is a, a newer formulation of his series. But back then when he did it, he, he just took salts. He didn't know that they actually dissociated. And to, to show you what happens, uh, I will show you some experimental data that really illustrates that this is a very strong effect. And here we have uh, osmotic second viral coefficient data measured using light scattering. And down here we have the, the salt concentration and here we have the viral coefficient. It's, uh, it's presented like this, one minus the viral coefficient. And then this is done in our different potassium salts. So from chloride, bromide, nitrate, iodide, and thiocyanate up here. And we see that thiocyanate here means that this induces very strong protein-protein interactions, whereas uh, much less interaction is induced um, using uh, potassium chloride. Not only that, what is even more puzzling is that if we cross the isoelectric point of the protein, then these Hofmeister series, they reverses. And the, the molecular level explanations for this, they have really puzzled uh, us for a very long time. But as I said, I think that most of it is known by now. Um, and I would say that there are two main mechanisms that control this and I'll try and go through them. So the mechanisms behind the ion specific effects. One of them is that we can have ions that can bind to the macromolecule. And um, <clears throat> here we have, this is, this is a, a model we made uh, now quite some time ago and uh, we use molecular dynamics to do this, but you can do the exact same uh, experiment on proteins and you would see basically the same what I'm about to, to, to tell you now. So the green ions, they are small anions and the red ones, they are big anions. So this could be, for example, fluoride and this could be iodide let's say. And now we have a macromolecule here where we have put some cationic patches on the surface. So um, these are plus one um, out here. And then this part here is has no charge. So it's apolar. And we embed this in explicit solvent. So everything, the solvent molecules are there. <clears throat> and we now just look where do these ions distribute on the surface of this uh, artificial uh, macro ion that we have constructed. And it looks something like this. That there is a really a distinct uh, absorption of the small ions, they go to the charged patches, and then the big iodide sized ions, they sit here in between in the much more apolar regions. So you could talk about that these are more, they have a more apolar character, these big ions, and it makes sense because they are, they are much less solvated than the small fluoride ions here that would be really highly solvated. They would sit, the water molecules would sit very tight. Um, <clears throat> if, we, if we transfer this to protein surfaces, it of course gets much more complicated because the solvation, if you, if, you, if you scan the surface of a protein, you will find that the solvation of the protein surface varies a lot. We can have cationic and anionic groups, and then we can have polar groups, we can have apolar groups, and all of that will have a special affinity to differently sized ions. So the binding of ions is really an important um, <clears throat> um, driving force for the, for the Hofmeister or ion specific effects. As a rule of thumb, we can, we can use this principle called the law of 
matching water affinities, and I'll show it here. And here we can see that ions of like sized, so like sized ions, cations and anions, they tend to pair together. They form strong ion pairs, whereas similarly sized ions, they, they tend to stay away from each other. You can see this in electrolyte solutions in the activity coefficient, you will find this kind of behavior. And we can translate that to the surface of macromolecules like proteins. Uh, and this is the reason why the small, the small uh, ions, they sit to the, they are attracted to these blue patches here because they have similarly similar size. So that's the reason why they accumulate like this. <clears throat> Whereas the big uh, red anions, they sit here in between, they're not so, uh, so happy. And, and, and all of this is due to the salvation properties of the ions versus where they bind. So that's one mechanism behind the, the uh, Hofmeister series. And the next one is the opposite. <clears throat> and that's exclusion of ions. And a typical example of this would be sulfate. So what we have here is, if we have, for example, um, a highly solvated ion like sulfate, it would be, in order for it to, to approach this poorly solvated uh, macromolecule I have over here, then they would have to let go of some of the solvation layer in order to get into here. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, an unfavorable process. So in order to reduce this excluded volume that we have around this molecule and here, one way to exclude that and gain more entropy for these ions is that we can simply push them together. So this is a sorting, um, sorting out effect. So the salt is pushing the, the particles together like this. Another way to view this is that you could say that there is an salt effect on the hydrophobic interaction. Um, and that effect is salt specific. So more weakly charged ions, like these ones we have up here, they are quite happy to enter this region. We can see that up here. So they can actually be absorbed on this apolar surface, especially if we have some charged patches as well. So it's really ion specific effects, both of these binding and exclusion of ions. Sort of from, from, a, from a theoretical point of view, um, if we want to make models where we can treat, for example, hundreds of particles of, of, uh, of macromolecules, this is really quite difficult to capture these effects because it's so, um, uh, it's so connected to the, to the um, solvation of the ion and of the macromolecule. And if, for example, we have implicit solvent models, then we lose all this information. It simply just isn't there. Um, so we have been working on ways to incorporate that into, into our models, even in systems where we don't even have explicit ions. And I'll try and, and show you how that can be done now. So one model we have and we are working on at the moment is, is one where we're using a solvent, solvent accessible surface area uh, approach. And here we have two proteins they're close together. And what we can do during a, a simulation is that we can, we can, for that particular configuration, we can now measure the solvent accessible surface area per residue. And um, this is a quite expensive calculation, but it's, we can do it. It's part of the, we can have it as part of the Hamiltonian. So we, on every step in our simulation, we calculate this, um, uh, Sasa for each residue. Now, <clears throat> what we do is that we let this change in the in the area. We let that be part of the Hamiltonian. In what in, the, in what I've written here, we have a, a parameter here that is salt specific and it's amino acid specific, and we then multiply that with the salt concentration over here. So, what this means is that. Depending on the sign of this uh, epsilon, we can either favor or, uh, or penalize the creation of area in the uh, between the, the proteins. So we could we could introduce attraction between the proteins or actually keep them apart. And if we keep them apart, that would correspond to an um, 
an iron binding to the surface, or if we push them together, that can be an iron exclusion to the surface. I should say that we have other ways to include iron binding, um, but I will not talk about it today. Uh, so, so this method here is mainly for treating um, exclusion of ions and how they can push the particles together. But it's a fairly expensive method as of now. Uh, what we've done is we've tried to apply this on a small molecule, uh, caffeine, and um, this is what I've illustrated here. So here we have a caffeine molecule and it has some distinct motifs and we have coarse grained it like this. And now we can simulate many of these caffeine molecules together using our many body assessor Hamiltonian that was described. And then by assigning, um, I go back once, sorry, to watch that once more. So if we assign um, these epsilon values to some of these motifs, we have some idea about, based on all that some molecular dynamics, we have some idea about how we, where the ions bind, or how they're excluded. We can then construct a model that can take into account ion specific effects on caffeine. And really the reason why we're looking at caffeine is that it's, it's a proxy for a small amino acid. And we would like to extend this so that we can describe uh, peptides and proteins uh, as well. So, First, if we look at here, we have calculated the osmotic coefficient of just caffeine in pure water as a function of caffeine concentration. <clears throat> caffeine very quickly um, starts to, to interact with itself and it can form, it can form stacked configurations. So it's, um, we cannot go to very high, high concentrations of caffeine because it's simply not soluble. Um, so this is just to test our model in, a, in pure water and using the, the, the Hamiltonian here where we use Sasa to describe the ion specific, specific effects, we can then look at the change in the excess chemical potential as we now increase the salt concentration. And here we have some experimental data and we try to, to compare that with our Monte Carlo results. So, so that's, that's ongoing work, I would say, in trying to incorporate these effects and see how molecules are, are being affected by, um, by different salts. Right. So that's a little bit about ion-specific or Hofmeister effects. And um, now we come to the, to the last part. We I would like to talk about some a few things about Van der Waals interactions that I think is perhaps not so well known in the protein field. It's very well known in the the uh, colloidal field, and um, if if some of you are from coming from there, then then you will probably have heard about this before. Um, so the image we have here is, um, is is actually painted by one of our collaborators, Cliff Woodward from Australia, and um, I just realized that it looks like I put an earring on, uh, on Van der Waals, but it's actually uh, because it's taken from a book cover uh, and, and there are some, some atoms, atoms on the side. Um, but um, nevertheless, let's continue with this topic. Um, so the, the Van der Waals interaction is actually a, it's actually a sum of different mechanisms. And um, we have three different mechanisms called I mean, dispersion interactions, we have dipole-dipole interactions between, if you have, for example, small polar molecules, and we can also have dipole-induced dipole interactions if you have something that's internally polarizable. Um, common to all of these, these interaction mechanisms is that they, they vary as one over R6. So they decay, the, the interaction energy decays quite rapidly with the distance. Um, because of this, it's, um, it's common that you will see them in models and in computer simulations, they have just been lumped together to one term. Um, so for example, the Leonard Jones potential, you will have the, the, um, the Van der Waals term comes in here. And a few notes here. Um, 
So A and B in simulations and theories, they are often used just in, as an empirical fitting parameter. Um, and I think this can sometimes be a little bit problematic, but it's, well, maybe not problematic, but it's, I think it's important to, to just realize that they are actually three different mechanisms. And for example, if we talk about explicit solvent models, and then the keysum part, the dipole dipole part is explicitly included. Um, but only if we have um, polarizable simulations, which I would say is not that common because they're very expensive, uh, then the Debye inter the Debye part is also included, but normally it isn't. So this means that if you take a standard all at a molecular dynamic simulation, it would be the Keesum and London interaction. Uh, that's that's part of the constant up here, right? If we go to implicit solvent models, um, and then then B in principle can be negative. It includes all of these terms, but it's an excess um, polarization that we have, and this means that it can in principle be negative. I've never seen that done, but uh, I, I think it maybe sometimes it could make sense. It could be that it, it would correspond that you have something of a, of a very high dielectric uh, that you approach something of a very low dielectric. Um, so that's just a comment about this and something that I think is not uh, talked about so much when we talk about Van der Waals interactions in these implicit solvent models at least not in the protein field. So finally, I would like to talk about another pro aspect of the Van der Waals interactions uh, that comes from the colloidal field that I, I, I never see mentioned in the protein field. And um, that is that the Van der Waals or these R6, one over R6 uh, potentials, they decay very rapidly. So they're, they're quite short ranged. But I'll try to illustrate this with the ants up here that when there are many of them together, they can actually uh, reach further. And um, just to show you this, so we have the potential here, one over R6, but then we have to remember that they are not alone. They sit, we have to evaluate this over all the atoms in the macromolecule. So it looks something like this. And we have to, in order to calculate the total energy, we have to sum up between all of these different uh, uh, particles here. And we can do that in computer simulations for any kind of shape we want, uh, no problem. But I think it can be interesting to do this also for more idealized shapes. So for example, if we do this for two spheres, uh, then it looks something like this. We have to integrate this one over R6 potential over these two volumes. And doing that, we end up with something that goes one over D, where D is the distance between the surfaces of these two spheres. So what this means is that the interaction here has gone from being a one over R6 potential to be something that decays as one over D, so much more long ranged. And this is important because this can be, uh, have very strong effect, effects on the, um, on the thermodynamic properties. So a long range interaction, long, especially long range attractive interactions will have a big impact when you start to uh, calculate uh, thermodynamic properties. Right, we have now reached the end of the talk. Um, and I would like to mention here in the end that we have if you're interested in simulating uh, many body protein systems, we have software available for this. Uh, we do a lot of protein uh, simulations, I would say, and many of the effects we've talked about, charge regulation, ion-specific effects, they are, we're trying to include that in these, uh, in these models. So with that, thank you for your attention.